Britain. Low pay. Min to the max. A plan to give Britain one of the world's highest minimum wages. Most Britons have not had a decent pay rise in years, but the people of West Somerset have done better than most. Since introducing the national living wage last April, the government has increased minimum hourly pay for the over 25s from six pounds seventy, that's eight dollars sixty, to seven pounds fifty, a steep rise by historical standards. By 2020, it is due to reach about nine pounds. A fifth of employees in West Somerset are paid the minimum, a greater share than in any other local authority, and compared with just one in twenty in London. Butlins, a holiday resort there, is recruiting heavily, and many of its vacancies, from kitchen porter to lifeguard, offer the minimum rate. Last year, average pay in West Somerset rose by five percent. Jeremy Corbyn, the leader of the Labour Party, wants to give low earners another pay rise. In its manifesto, Labour is expected to pledge to introduce a ten-pound hourly minimum by 2020. That would probably give Britain the highest wage floor of any big rich country. Could the labour market handle it? The worry is that unemployment would rise as low-skilled jobs would become untenable. Indeed, that seems to have happened recently in America. Yet British economy watchers have been surprised time and again since the minimum wage was introduced by a Labour government in 1999. Increases have not caused joblessness to rise by much. Low-paid workers have benefited. Even those earning above the minimum have enjoyed better pay. After the minimum wage went up, it was snapping at my heels. So I asked for a raise," says Harriet, a council administrator in West Somerset. She got one. At a vintage shop selling starchy napkins and Victorian marmalade jars, the owner says her bottom line has not been affected much by the minimum wage so far. Alex de Mendoza of the local chamber of commerce says that few local firms complain about it. They are more concerned about business rates. Some have cut their employees' perks in order to save on costs. The owner of one local cafe offers fewer free lunches to her staff. Not many seem to have responded by laying off their workers. West Somerset's unemployment rate is just three percent. The job centre looks deserted. How much more can firms afford to pay? Under the current government's plans, the minimum wage will continue rising, from about 55 percent of median earnings at the moment to 60 percent in 2020. Official forecasts suggest that this could ultimately cost around 100,000 jobs, equivalent to a rise in the unemployment rate of around 0.3 percentage points. Those forecasts imply that Mr. Corbyn's proposal could cost about the same amount again. The upshot would be that Britain's economy would look more like those of other rich countries, most of which have recently had higher unemployment than Britain, but also higher wage growth. The competition between Labour and the Tories over minimum wage levels ignores a better way to help the poor. The Labour governments of Tony Blair and Gordon Brown boosted in-work benefits such as tax credits, wage top-ups for the low-paid. The Conservatives are now cutting them with zest. Unlike higher minimum wages, tax credits do not threaten jobs, since their cost is borne by taxpayers rather than employers. And increases in the minimum wage help poor families less than is commonly supposed. Many low-paid folk are second earners in middle-income families. Think the mum with a part-time cleaning job, whereas many of the poorest households do not work at all. The government's existing plans to raise the minimum wage are already expected to benefit households in the seventh income decile, i.e., nearer the richest, by three times as much as those in the bottom decile. Mr. Corbyn's pledge to help low earners is welcome, but there are better ways to do it than with a ten-pound minimum wage. Britain. Budget. The other election. A cohort of powerful new mayors will do more to change Britain than most MPs.
In preparing to take over as Badgett, your columnist immersed himself in Anthony Trollope's novels. He was particularly struck by a passage in Can You Forgive Her? As he walks for the first time through the gate reserved for members of Parliament, one of Trollope's characters is overawed by the majesty of the place. The passageways echo with the glory of centuries. The House of Commons is the fullest fountain of advancing civilization. There is no greater honour available to an Englishman than to put the letters M.P. after his name. There are few people today who share that view, yet the British are still obsessed by general elections. On May 4th, millions of Britons will engage in one of the most important political innovations in recent decades, electing six powerful new regional mayors. The regions up for grabs include Britain's second and third biggest cities, Birmingham and Manchester. But Theresa May's decision to announce a general election the following month has fixated the nation's attention on Westminster. This is understandable. Britain is the most centralised, rich country in the world, after tiny New Zealand. London is the world's most outsized capital city, sucking life out of the rest of the country. But Westminster is beginning to lose its monopoly of political talent and political innovation. The mayor's elections on May 4th may say as much about the future of British politics as the general election on June 8th. A career in Westminster is no longer as attractive as it used to be. Salaries have stagnated compared with other top-flight jobs, and the career structure is odd. British political life is characterised by long political cycles. The Tories were in power for four terms after 1979, and Labour for three terms after 1997. It will take a long time for Labour to dig itself out of its current hole. This means that MPs on the wrong side might spend more than a decade twiddling their thumbs in opposition. Even those who pick the winning team can have a bumpy time. They might be lucky in their early years, taken up by a patron and dropped into a big job, only to fizzle in mid-career. Ed Balls, a shadow chancellor, lost his seat aged 48 and was reduced to competing with some success on Strictly Come Dancing, a televised dance competition. The job of running a big city region now provides an appealing alternative to staying in Westminster for established MPs or starting off there for outsiders. Andy Burnham, a long-standing Manchester MP, is a safe bet to become Labour Mayor of the city. Andy Street, a former head of the John Lewis retail chain, is hoping to create an upset as the Tories' candidate for Mayor of the West Midlands, which includes several black country towns as well as Birmingham. Haltingly, Britain is becoming more like America, with several different centres of power and several greasy poles to the top. Britain has previously gone through the motions of handing power to the provinces only for central government to grab it back. Most dramatically, Margaret Thatcher presided over a decade of centralisation after the decentralisation of the 1970s. There are some worrying auguries. The biggest champion of elected mayors... George Osborne, is retiring from British politics. For a while, Mrs May, no fan of Mr Osborne, banned officials from even mentioning the northern powerhouse that he had talked up. The new mayors will control only about 5% of their local tax base, compared with 50% in New York, say. There are nevertheless reasons for thinking that it will be different this time. The new mayors will run entire regions, rather than just local authorities, This means that they are more than glorified city councillors. They will be directly elected, making them accountable to voters and giving them the soft power that comes from having far larger constituencies than any MP, including the Prime Minister, who is chosen only by his or her party. London's mayor was elected by more than a million votes. The experience of London has been positive. The capital's mayors have expanded their powers while remaining broadly popular. The proportion of Londoners voting in mayoral elections has increased from 34% in 2000, when the first one was held, to 46% in 2016. Far from ending your Westminster career, being Mayor of London can boost it. Boris Johnson is now Foreign Secretary. Sadiq Khan, his successor, is burnishing his chances of becoming Labour leader by running one of the world's great cities, 
rather than marching to disaster next to Jeremy Corbyn. The new crop of mayors is part of a global movement which boasts such figures as Michael Bloomberg, a former mayor of New York, and Park Wonsoon, the mayor of Seoul. There is even talk of establishing a worldwide parliament of mayors. This is all to the good. Britain is the prisoner of a cult of centralised government that was created in the age of mass production but is increasingly irrelevant in the age of tailoring and customization. This cult is killing innovation. A striking proportion of the most interesting policy experiments in everything from giving schools more freedom to using smartphones to coordinate ride-sharing have come from American mayors. Centralization is also alienating people from their government. Mr Burnham expresses some regrets about leaving the House of Commons. Life there can be thrilling, but he also waxes lyrical about the prospect of running Manchester if he is elected. While Parliament is overwhelmed by Brexit, he will be able to try out new ideas, for example about developing property banks to end rough sleeping, and also reconnect politics with the people. The Brexit vote was an expression of anger about a political establishment that had lost touch. Britain should respond by cutting the House of Commons down to size and handing power back to the regions. The country needs more than one fountain of advancing civilization. International. The Economist, April 29th to May 5th, 2017, in the international section. End of life care, mending mortality, and how people want to die. A melancholy poll. International. End of life care, mending mortality. Doctors are slowly realising that there is a better way to care for the dying. A stroll from Todoroki Station, at the kink of a path lined with cherry trees, lies a small wooden temple. A baby Buddha sits on the sill. The residents of the Tokyo suburb ask the infant for Pin Pin Kurori. It is a wish for two things. The first is a long, spry life. The second is a quick and painless death. Just part of this wish is likely to be granted. The paradox of modern medicine is that people are living longer and yet doing so with more disease. Death is rarely either quick or painless. Often it is traumatic. As the end nears, people tend to have goals that matter more than eking out every last second – but too few are asked what matters most to them. In the rich world, most people die in a hospital or nursing home, often after pointless, aggressive treatment. Many die alone, confused and in pain. The distress is largely unnecessary. Fortunately, medicine is beginning to take a more thoughtful approach to people with terminal illness. Reformers are overhauling how end-of-life care is delivered, and improving communication between doctors and patients. The changes mean that patients will experience less pain and suffering, and they will have more control over their lives right up until the end. Many aspects of death changed during the 20th century. One was when it happens. The average lifespan increased by more over the past four generations than over the previous 8,000. In 1900, global life expectancy at birth was about 32 years, little more than at the dawn of agriculture. It is now 71.8 years. In large part, that is a result of lower infant and child mortality. A century ago, about a third of children died before their fifth birthday. But it is also because adults live longer. Today, a 50-year-old Englishman can expect to live for another 33 years, 13 more than in 1900. The chance of an adult dying was once largely unrelated to age. Infections were indiscriminate. Michel de Montaigne, a French essayist who died in 1592, wrote that death in old age was 
rare, singular and extraordinary. Now, says Catherine Sleeman of King's College London, death mostly comes by stealth. She estimates that in Britain only a fifth of deaths are sudden, for example in a car crash. Another fifth follow a swift decline, as with some cancer patients, who stay fairly active until their final few weeks. But three-fifths come after years of relapse and recovery. They involve a slow progressive deterioration of function, Dr. Sleeman says. People in rich countries can spend eight to ten years seriously ill at the end of life. Chronic illness is rising in poorer countries too. In 2015, it accounted for more than three quarters of premature mortality in China, according to the Global Burden of Disease, a survey. In 1990, the share was just a half. The World Health Organization, the WHO, predicts that rates of cancer and heart disease in sub-Saharan Africa will more than double by 2030. A side effect of progress, however, has been what Atul Gawande, a surgeon and author, calls the experiment of making mortality a medical experience. A century ago, most deaths were at home. Now, according to a survey of 45 rich countries by the WHO, fewer than a third are. Death also used to be egalitarian, says Heide Verreich of Duke University Medical Center and the author of Modern Death. Income did not much affect when or where people died. Today, poor people in rich countries are more likely than their better-off compatriots to die in hospital. Many deaths are preceded by a surge of treatment, often pointless. A survey of doctors in Japan found that 90% expected that patients with tubes inserted into their windpipes would never recover. Yet a fifth of patients who die in the country's hospitals have been intubated. An eighth of Americans with terminal cancer receive chemotherapy in their final fortnight, despite it offering no benefit at such a late stage. Nearly a third of elderly Americans undergo surgery during their final year. 8% do so in their last week. The way healthcare is funded encourages overtreatment. Hospitals are paid for doing things to people, not for preventing pain. And not only patients, but those who love them suffer. Many people who may need intubation or artificial ventilation are not in a condition to indicate consent. An American study found that in about half of cases involving decisions about the withdrawal of treatment, there is conflict between family and doctors. A third of relatives of patients in intensive care units, or ICUs, report symptoms of post-traumatic stress disorder. Many people will want to rage, rage against the dying of the light, as the poet Dylan Thomas put it. Others will have particular events they want to attend, a grandchild's graduation, say. But the medical crescendo often occurs by default, not as a result of personal choice based on a clearly understood prognosis. The huge gap between what people want from end-of-life care and what they are likely to get is visible in a survey conducted by The Economist in partnership with the Kaiser Family Foundation, an American healthcare think tank. Representative samples of people in four large countries with differing demographics, religious traditions and levels of development – America, Brazil, Italy and Japan – were asked a set of questions about dying and end-of-life care. Most had lost close friends or family in the previous five years. In all four countries, the majority of people said they hoped to die at home – but fewer said they expected to do so, and even fewer said that their deceased loved ones had. Apart from in Brazil, only small shares said that extending life as long as possible was more important than dying without pain, discomfort and stress. Other research suggests that wish too is increasingly unlikely to be granted. One study found that between 1998 and 2010, 
the shares of Americans experiencing confusion, depression and pain in their final year all increased. What healthy people think they will want when they are mortally ill may well change when that moment comes. Life becomes mighty precious when there is not a lot left, says Diane Meyer, a geriatrician at Mount Sinai Hospital in New York. It is common, for example, to hate the idea of a feeding tube, but grudgingly accept one when the alternative is death. Yet the gap between what people hope for and what they get cannot be explained away so easily. Dying people's wishes are often unknown or ignored. Among those involved in making decisions about a loved one's end-of-life care, more than a third in Italy, Japan and Brazil said they did not know what their friend or family member wanted. Either they never asked or only thought to do so too late. A Japanese woman who cared for her mother, an Alzheimer's patient, says she regrets that once the door closed, there was no way of knowing what she wanted. And sometimes, even when relatives know a loved one's wishes, they cannot make sure they are granted. Between 12% and 24% of those who had lost someone close to them said that the patient's wishes had not been carried out. Between 25% and 38% said that friends or family had experienced needless pain. Across the whole survey, most people rated the quality of end-of-life care as fair or poor. End-of-life care can resemble a conspiracy of silence, says Robert Fine of Baylor Scott & White Health, a Texan healthcare provider. In our survey, majorities in all four countries said that death is a subject which is generally avoided. An obvious reason is that death is feared. In every calm and reasonable person, there is a hidden second person scared witless about death, says the narrator of a Philip Roth novel. One school of psychology, terror management theory, holds that fear of death is the source of everything distinctively human, from phobias to religion. But death was once what Philippe Ariès, a French historian, called a public ceremony where friends and family gathered. Now, changing family structures mean the elderly and dying are more isolated from younger people, who are therefore less likely to witness death up close or to find a suitable moment to talk about its approach. Just 10% of Europeans aged over 80 live with their families, Half live alone. By 2020, 40% of Americans are expected to die alone in nursing homes. In Japan, where survey respondents were most likely to say that not being a financial burden was a primary consideration, daughters are abandoning their traditional caring role. That has given rise to institutions such as the House of Hope, a hospice in East Tokyo, that looks after people who are too poor for hospital care and too alone to die at home. A decade ago, Hisako Yanagida, 88, lost her husband, with whom she had sung in a traditional Japanese troupe. Now her sight is going, but she can still make out the faded pictures of the two of them on her wall. She tries not to think about death. There is no point. But the chief responsibility for the failures of end-of-life care lies with medicine. The relationship between doctors and seriously ill patients is one of mutual suspicion, says Naoki Ikigami of St. Luke's International University in Tokyo. A decade ago, it was common for Japanese doctors to withhold cancer diagnoses. Today, they are more honest, but still insensitive. One Japanese woman recalls her oncologist saying that if her chemotherapy made her bald, it would not be a big deal. And doctors commonly overestimate how long the terminally ill will live, making it more likely that they will duck frank conversations or recommend drastic treatments that have little chance of success. One international review of prognoses of patients who die within two months suggests that seriously ill people live on average little more than half as long as their doctors suggested they would. 
Another study found that, for patients who died within four weeks of receiving a prognosis, doctors had predicted the date to within a week in just a quarter of cases. Mostly, they had erred on the side of optimism. Doctors often neglect palliative care, which involves giving opioids for pain, treating breathlessness and counselling patients. The name comes from the Latin palliare, as in to cloak pain. A typical question is, what is important to you now? It does not seek to cure. As a result, it is seen as what you do when you give up on a patient, sighs Dr. Ikigami. It receives just 0.2% of the funding for cancer research in Britain and 1% in America. What studies there have been show the cost of this neglect. Since 2009, several randomised controlled trials have looked at what happens when patients with advanced cancer are given palliative care alongside standard treatment, such as chemotherapy. In each, the group receiving palliative care had lower rates of depression, and in all but one study, patients in that group were less likely to report pain. Remarkably, in three trials, the patients receiving palliative care lived longer, even though the quantity of conventional treatment they opted to receive was lower. The other two trials showed no difference. In one study, their median survival was a year, compared with nine months for the group receiving only ordinary treatment. A review in 2016 of cases where palliative care was used instead of standard treatment found that even when it was the only care given, it did not seem to shorten life. The reason for the results is unclear, and the research has mostly been on cancer patients. Those receiving palliative care spend less time in hospital, so may contract fewer infections. But some researchers think that the explanation is psychological, that through counselling they reduce depression, which is linked to earlier death. A conversation can be more powerful than technology, says Dr. Sleeman. At St. Luke's Hospital in Tokyo, Yuki Asano supports the argument. Ever the executive, the 76-year-old slides his business card across the tray of his bed. The former boss of a brewery company, and seventh dan in kendo, a Japanese martial art, is riddled with cancer. He stopped chemotherapy last year. The care at one of Japan's few dedicated palliative centres has helped him feel ready for death. I achieved everything I wanted in life, he says. Now I am waiting for the awards ceremony. But few of the 56 million or so people who die each year receive good end-of-life care. A report published in 2015 by the Economist Intelligence Unit, our sister company, assessed the quality of death in 80 countries. Only Austria and America, the EIU found, had the capacity to ensure that at least half the patients for whom palliative care was suitable received it. Many countries promise public access to palliative care but do not pay for it. Spain has passed two laws to ensure palliative care is available – but in reality, just a quarter of patients can get it. Though the hospice movement, dedicated to providing high-quality care to dying patients, started in Britain in the 1960s, only about a fifth of the country's hospitals provide access to palliative care every day of the week. The way healthcare providers are funded often sidelines palliative care. In Japan, Hospital doctors receive no payment from insurers for talking to patients about end-of-life options. In America, hospitals suck up a big share of spending, even though the seriously ill are often better treated elsewhere. Nine in ten emergency visits are because of escalations in symptoms, such as breathlessness. Most of these patients could be treated better, faster and more cheaply at home. Medicare, the public health scheme for the elderly, does not generally cover spells in nursing homes. Slowly, however, countries are reforming. In 2014, the WHO recommended integrating palliative care with health systems. Some developing countries, 
including Ecuador, Mongolia and Sri Lanka, are beginning to do so. In America, some insurers are realising that what would be better for patients would be better for them too. In 2015, Medicare announced that it would pay for conversations about end-of-life care between doctors and patients. Talking almost always helps, and yet we don't talk, says Susan Block of Harvard Medical School. To improve end-of-life care, she says, every doctor needs to be an expert in communicating. American oncologists, for example, need to have an average of 35 conversations per month about end-of-life care. In a study of patients with congestive heart failure, doctors rarely followed up after a patient expressed a fear of death. Nearly three-quarters of nephrologists were never taught how to tell patients they are dying. A common cause of burnout among doctors is an inability to talk with patients about death. To fill this gap, Ariadne Labs, a research group founded by Dr. Gawande, has launched the Serious Illness Conversation Guide. It is a straightforward checklist of the topics doctors should be sure to talk about with their terminally ill patients. They should start by asking what patients understand about their conditions, check how much each wants to know, offer an honest prognosis, and ask about their goals and the trade-offs each is willing to make. Early results from a trial of the guide at the Dana-Farber Cancer Institute in Boston suggest it led to doctors having more and earlier conversations. Patients reported less anxiety. Tension between doctors and families was eased. The scheme is being expanded. In February, Baylor, Scott & White became the first big provider to use it for all its staff. England's National Health Service is trying it out in Clatterbridge near Liverpool. Japan is retraining its oncologists in how to talk about death. In America, advanced directives and living wills, documents that spell out the treatment people want if they become incapacitated, have become more popular over the past few decades. In our survey, 51% of Americans over 65 had written down their end-of-life wishes. Yet such documents cannot cover all the possibilities that may arise as the end nears. Doctors worry that patients may have changed their minds. In one study, just 43% of people who had written living wills wanted the same treatment course two years later. Living wills are rare outside America, but there is a broader cultural shift. More than 4,400 death cafes where people eat cake and talk about mortality have sprung up. They discuss books such as When Breath Becomes Air by the late Paul Kalanithi, a neurosurgeon, and the documentary Extremis, which is set in an intensive care unit and offers a more honest account of hospital care than in popular TV shows. In Japan, ending notebooks are now available to record messages and instructions for relatives. In 2010, Ellen Goodman, an American author, founded The Conversation Project, which started with people gathering to share stories of the good deaths and bad deaths experienced by their loved ones. It publishes guides like those from Ariadne Labs, but for use by people without medical training. Laurie Kay, an 80-something from Boston, recently told her husband and daughter that what mattered to her was dignity. She wants to look good. Her nails should be painted. Her views may change, she says, but having opened the conversation now, we can reopen it later. Experiences of death are being shared online. Dying Matters is a popular forum. In 2013, Scott Simon, a journalist, tweeted from his mother's bedside as she died. Heart rate dropping, heart dropping, read one tweet. Kate Granger, an English geriatrician who died of cancer last year, planned to tweet during her final days using the tag hashtag deathbedlive. She did not quite manage it, 
that a tweet she prepared was sent posthumously. Thank you all for being part of my life. Please look after my amazing hubby at Point and Chris. P.S. Don't let him spend all his money on a Range Rover. Kiss, kiss. Bringing death within the pale of conversation is needed to overhaul end-of-life care, argues Dr. Vareich. Yet the death-positive movement is not an excuse for medicine to remain stuck in its ways. Death will remain terrifying for many people. Unless the way health care is organised changes, most people will continue to suffer unnecessarily at the end. International End of Life Care Death Wishes Living as long as possible is not people's main concern. After his stroke, Maria's father could no longer speak, but with his daughter reciting the words next to him, he could still pray. His final days brought a lot of pain, but Maria believes that at the end, as he clasped her hand, he was at peace. When she thinks about her own priorities for her death, being at peace spiritually is top of the list. It is a sentiment shared by fellow Brazilians, according to a survey conducted jointly by The Economist and the Kaiser Family Foundation, an American non-profit focused on health. Fully 88% thought that being at peace spiritually at the end was extremely or very important. In America and Japan, not burdening families with the costs of care was the highest ranked priority, cited as extremely important by 54% and 59% respectively. The Japanese may be worrying about the cost of funerals, which can easily reach 3 million yen, or $27,000. A third of Italians emphasised having loved ones around them. Brazil was the only country where more people said they would put extending life ahead of reducing pain and stress than the other way round. Religion accounts for some of these differences. There are more Catholics in Brazil than any other country. Many have presumably been influenced by their church's long insistence that life should be extended whenever possible, even by heroic measures. In court battles in America and elsewhere, when families have sought to have feeding tubes removed from relatives who are in a persistent vegetative state, the church has often been opposed, though it now condemns only active measures to hasten death rather than patients' decisions to reject treatment or death that is hastened by pain relief. 83% of Brazilians said that religion played a major role in their thinking about end-of-life care against 50% of people in America and 46% in Italy. In Japan, just 13% said that religion played a major role in their thinking. In other surveys, most Japanese report that they are atheists or have no formal religious affiliation. But the idea of spiritual peace is nonetheless important in Japan. It is ranked second for what matters close to death. The relative weights people place on extending life and easing death are also shaped by the quality of care available and perceptions of what they will personally receive. 90% of Brazilians rated their healthcare system as fair slash poor, compared with 54 to 61% in the other three countries. Though their constitution guarantees comprehensive free healthcare for all, it falls far short of that ideal. Even before a crippling recession that has already lasted three years, care was often precarious. More recently, cash-strapped hospitals in big cities, including Rio de Janeiro, have seen patients die in corridors. In America, Italy and Japan, people with degrees were most likely to say that too much emphasis is placed on extending life towards its end as opposed to alleviating suffering. Better educated people were also more likely to say patients and families should play a bigger role in decisions about end-of-life care. Almost half of black Americans and nearly as many Latinos said that healthcare placed too little emphasis on preventing death, compared with just 28% of white Americans.
Other research has found that minorities are more likely to die in hospital than white Americans. Richer Americans are more likely to die at home or in a hospice than those on lower incomes. All of which suggests a bitter irony. Those who most need hospital care may receive it only when it is too late. Business. The Economist, April 29th to May 5th, 2017, in the business section. The Office of Tomorrow, sofas and surveillance. Flying cars, high in the sky. Schumpeter on Government Inc. and more. Business. The Office of Tomorrow. Sofas and surveillance. Tech firms are on a building spree. Their offices provide clues to the future of work. From the 62nd floor of Salesforce Tower, 920 feet above the ground, San Francisco's monuments look piddling. The Bay Bridge, Coit Tower, and Palace of Fine Arts are dwarfed by the steel and glass headquarters that will house the software company when it is completed later this year. Subtle, it is not. Salesforce plans to put on a light show every night. Its new building will be visible from up to 30 miles away. It is not the only technology company erecting a shrine to itself. Apple's employees have just begun moving into their new headquarters in Cupertino, some 70 kilometers away, which was conceived by the firm's late founder Steve Jobs. The four-story circular building looks like the dial of an iPod or a donut, and is the same size as the Pentagon. At a price tag of around five billion dollars, it will be the most expensive corporate headquarters ever constructed. Apple applied all its product perfectionism to it. The guidelines for the wood used inside it reportedly ran to thirty pages. Throughout San Francisco and Silicon Valley. Cash-rich technology firms have built or are erecting bold, futuristic headquarters that convey their brands to employees and customers. Another example is Uber, a ride-hailing company which is hoping to recast its reputation for secrecy and rugged competitiveness by designing an entirely see-through head office. It is expected to have some interior areas as well as a park that will be open to the public. The exteriors of the new buildings will attract most attention, but it is their interiors that should be watched more closely. The very newest buildings, such as Apple's, are mostly still under wraps, but they are expected to be highly innovative in their internal layout. Some of that is because of fierce competition within the tech industry for the best engineering and other talent. Firms are particularly keen to come up with attractive, productive environments. But these new office spaces will also signal how work is likely to evolve. Technology companies have already changed the way people behave in offices beyond their own industry, as a result of email, online search, and collaboration tools such as Slack. They are doing the same for physical spaces. The big idea championed by the industry is the concept of working in various spaces around an office. Rather than at a fixed workstation, other industries have experimented with activity-based working, but tech is ahead. Employees may still have an assigned desk, but they are not expected to be there, and they routinely go to different places to do various tasks. There are libraries where they can work quietly, as well as coffee shops, cafes, and outdoor spaces for meetings and phone calls. The top two floors of Salesforce Tower, for example, will be used not as corner offices for executives, but as an airy lounge for employees, where they can work communally and gaze out at the views over a latte. A fluid working environment is meant to allow for more chance encounters, which could spur new ideas and spark unexpected collaborations. Facebook's central building is the world's largest open-plan office. Designed to encourage employees to bump into one another in its common spaces and in a nine-acre rooftop garden, 
Communal areas are meant to be casual and alluring. John Shetler, head of real estate at Amazon, says he aims to make them into living room like spaces. For offices to feel like home, it helps to hire a designer with expertise in residential real estate, says Elizabeth Pinkham of Salesforce. In common areas at the firm's offices, there are TVs, couches, and bookshelves. Framed photos of a few employees add to the effect. For those who scoff at the creative benefits of being surrounded by pictures of Colin from accounts, there are more tangible payoffs. The lack of fixed workstations shrinks the amount of expensive real estate given to employees without leaving them feeling too squeezed. Tech firms devote around 14 square meters to each employee, around a quarter less than other industries, according to Randy Howder at Gensler, a design firm. Young workers are thought to be more productive in these varied environments, which are reminiscent of the way people study and live at university. One drawback, however, is that finding colleagues can be difficult. Employees need to locate each other through text messages and messaging apps. Collaborative spaces can also expose generational tensions, says Louise Mozingo, an architecture professor at the University of California, Berkeley. Tech firms' elderly employees, otherwise known as the over forties, can struggle to adjust to moving around during the day, and to the frequent disruptions that come from large open-plan offices. Many of Facebook's employees do not like their office because it is noisy, and some Apple employees are hesitant to move into their new building for the same reason. Plenty also balk at the massive distances they will need to walk. That may not be the only thing to cause employees concern. Tech firms are increasingly keen to use their own products in their headquarters. Jensen Huang, the chief executive of Nvidia, a chip-making firm whose graphics processing units are widely used in artificial intelligence programs, says his firm plans to introduce facial recognition for entry into its new headquarters due to open later this year. Nvidia will also install cameras to recognize what food people are taking from the cafeteria and charge them accordingly, eliminating the need for a queue and cashier. A self-driving shuttle will eventually zip between its various buildings, and Nvidia's own AI will monitor when employees arrive and leave, with the ostensible aim of adjusting the building's heating and cooling systems. The data that firms can collect on their employees' whereabouts and activities are bound to become ever more detailed. Another way of keeping tabs on people is through company-issued mobile phones. Every employee has their own tracking device, observes Mr. Howder at Gensler. Technology firms will sooner or later take advantage of that. Few of them are willing to share details of their future plans. Because of concerns about employees' privacy, however, some of their contractors signal what sort of innovations may be in the pipeline. Office furniture makers, for example, are experimenting with putting sensors in desks and chairs, so that firms will be better able to monitor when workers are there. Such data could be anonymized to allay privacy concerns. They could also save electricity. Or help people find an empty room to hold a meeting, but it is not hard to imagine how such data could create a culture of surveillance, where employees feel constantly monitored. Technology firms could be an indicator of what will happen with privacy in offices more generally, says David Benjamin of Autodesk, a company that sells software to architects among other clients. A less controversial trend is for unusual office interiors. These can distinguish companies in the minds of their employees, act as a recruiting tool, and also give staff a reason to come into the office rather than work from home. For companies that do not ship a physical product, such offices can serve as important daily reminders of culture and purpose. Last year, LinkedIn, a professional social network, for example, opened a new building in San Francisco that is full of space set aside for networking, and that includes a silent disco where people can dance to music with headphones on.
Instead of offering generic meeting rooms with portentous names, Airbnb, a tech firm that lets people rent out their homes, has designed each of its meeting spaces after one of its rental listings, such as a Bedouin tent from Morocco. It also has a meeting room that is an exact replica of the rental apartment where the founders lived when they came up with the idea for Airbnb. Every detail, including the statue of Jesus in red velvet on top of the fireplace, is accurate, says Joe Gebbia, one of the company's founders. Nvidia is obsessed with triangles, the basic element of computer graphics used to create lifelike scenes in video games and movies. Its new headquarters, which cost three hundred and seventy million dollars, is shaped like one, and its interior is full of them. Everything from the skylights to the benches in the lobby is triangular. At this point, I'm kind of over the triangle shape, because we took that theme and beat it to death. Admits John O'Brien, the company's head of real estate, who pointedly vetoed a colleague's recent suggestion to offer triangle-shaped water bottles in the cafeteria. Such workspaces remind staff that they are choosing not just an employer, but a way of life. In the tech bubble of the late 1990s, companies disrupted the workplace by offering foosball tables, nap pods, blow-up castles, and free lunches. Now the emphasis is on amenities that help employees save time. Larger firms, including Facebook, Alphabet, and LinkedIn, offer their staff something akin to the services used by the extremely wealthy, helping employees to find places to live, adopt pets, and the like. Some large tech groups offer on-site healthcare. The effect of all this is that the typical office at a technology firm. Is becoming a prosperous, self-contained village. Employees have fewer reasons than ever to leave. With the spare cash they can throw at their employees, tech giants have vastly raised the bar for other kinds of company, which also want to recruit clever engineers and techies for their projects. Other industries would be wise to take time to watch how tech firms are structuring their work environments. There is certainly a chance of a backlash against those that use their products to watch employees too closely. Workers may like free lunches and other perks associated with the tech business, but probably not enough to surrender their privacy entirely. Business. Corporate tax reform in America, cutting the tangle. Stephen Mnuchin makes a start on tax reform, but there is more to do. Of the things that investors and bosses have come to like about Donald Trump, the most important is his promise to redraw America's knackered corporate tax system. On April 26th, Stephen Mnuchin, the Treasury Secretary, laid out a guide for reform. After weeks of anticipation, Wall Street will be relieved. The thrust of the plan is just what business folk want—a simpler system with lower bills. But whether it helps the wider economy and ordinary citizens remains to be seen. And Mr. Trump will have to push the reforms through a bitterly divided Congress. The actual tax rate America's businesses pay in aggregate of 20 to 25 percent is much lower than the high headline federal tax rate of 35 percent. But in the home of free enterprise, the tax man's treatment of business is a model. There are three distortions. First, the treatment of overseas profits. Unlike most countries, America taxes them when they are remitted back home at high rates. The result is that American firms refuse to repatriate all their earnings and collectively stash some one trillion dollars of cash abroad. The second distortion is that loopholes encourage firms to change their legal status from ordinary C corporations into more exotic legal forms, including S corps, private firms with under 100 shareholders, partnerships, real estate investment trusts, and sole proprietorships. Usually, these hybrid forms do not pay tax at the corporate level. Instead, the recipients of their profits, individuals or other legal entities, pay income tax. The number of these distortions has become astonishingly large. 
They make up 31 million of America's 33 million businesses and range from mom and pop firms to plutocrats' hedge funds. They account for half of all profits, up from a fifth in 1980. Third, as in many countries, the tax code encourages firms to borrow rather than raise equity as interest is tax deductible. That led some to pile on debt before the financial crisis and means some industries, including private equity and property, are addicted to borrowing. This month, the IMF warned about corporate debt. Mr Mnuchin's tax plan touches on two of the three problems – America will move to a territorial tax system in which profits are taxed by the country they are earned in. It will also allow firms to bring home their stash of profits at a rate well below the statutory 35%. Most of the profits hoarded abroad are owned by technology and pharmaceutical giants that are unlikely to start an investment binge at home. Still, the plan will raise some revenue and make running global firms simpler. Next, the Treasury Secretary wants to cut the rate of tax paid by all firms to 15%, regardless of their legal status and size. This will cut tax bills, boosting overall corporate profits by perhaps $230 billion, or 10%. And it should reduce the incentive for ordinary C-corps, which in aggregate pay an actual rate of about 30%, to metamorphose into more complex and opaque legal forms. Mr Mnuchin did not say anything about limiting the amount of interest that companies can deduct against their profits. Still, it is possible that the administration will pursue this since it increases the base of profits that is taxed, raising revenue to pay for the headline tax rate cut. Will the plan fly? One problem is the cost of the business tax cuts. A rough estimate is 1% of GDP a year, offset partly by a one-off gain from the repatriation of offshore cash. The other difficulty is whether it favours the wealthy too much. There are 24 million sole proprietorships, many of them small family firms. But they already pay a low rate of about 15%. Instead, tax cuts could help distorporations owned by tycoons, including Mr Trump's own firm. Mr Mnuchin's plan is a decent start – but if he wants support from Congress and from the public, he must do more to show that it is about unleashing the energy of America, Inc., not borrowing to help the rich. Business Flying cars High in the sky Firms such as E-Volo, Lilium and Uber are reimagining the daily commute. You may smile, but it will come, said Henry Ford in 1940, predicting the arrival of a machine that was part automobile and part aeroplane. For decades, flying cars have obsessed technologists, but eluded their mastery. Finally, there is reason to believe. Several firms have offered hope that flying people in small pods for short trips might become a reality in the next decade. These are not cars, as most are not fit to drive on land, but rather small vehicles which can rise and land vertically like quiet helicopters. A prototype of a small electric plane that is capable of flying up to 300 kilometres per hour, made by Lilium, a German startup, completed a successful test over Bavaria on April 20th. Lilium is starting work on a five-seat vehicle and hopes to offer a ride-hailing service. Another German company, Evolo, has been testing a flying vehicle for several years. It recently showed off the second version of its electric Volocopter, which could be certified for flight as soon as next year. There are at least a dozen firms experimenting with making small flying vehicles in different guises, including Airbus, an aerospace giant, in partnership with Ital Design Giugiaro, a division of Volkswagen, a car maker pilot in command at the beginning and then move on to an autonomous setup when regulations allow. Motorcycle type vehicles which you sit astride are also in the works. 
No matter which manufacturer is quickest to gain velocity, Uber, a ride-hailing firm, aims to be at the centre of things. On April 25th, it held an event in Dallas to announce its plan to offer a service where people can hail an electric vertical takeoff and landing vehicle and ride it quickly to destinations that would otherwise take hours in heavy traffic. Uber does not want to build these aircraft or landing pads itself, just as it does not own its own cars. Instead, it plans to collaborate with other companies. But Jeff Holden, Uber's chief product officer, does not exclude the possibility that the firm may, at the outset, own some aircraft, which he estimates will cost around one million dollars each. The firm plans to have a prototype of its service ready by 2020. It will launch it first in Dallas and in Dubai, both cities where the authorities have deep aviation expertise and where people commute long distances. The firm, rather optimistically, promises that the cost per aerial mile for passengers will be roughly that of its low-cost car service, Uber X. There is plenty for manufacturers and services like Uber to overcome beyond gravity. For battery-powered models, range is limited and the charging rate remains slow. Manufacturers will need to ensure that vehicles can take off and land quietly if this new form of transport is to stand a chance in cities. How to oversee and license the new aircraft, which are subject to much tougher rules than cars, will be a subject of intense debate among rulemakers, who tend to move slowly and are just getting to grips with drones. Drivers of flying vehicles are also likely to require a pilot's license, albeit perhaps a simplified sports license. The journey ahead will be a long one. Business. Lafarge Holcim and Syria. In a fix, the boss of the world's largest cement maker resigns. Keeping cool in the heat of war is not easy. That might help explain why Lafarge Holcim, a French-Swiss cement maker, blundered so badly while running operations in Syria as fighting raged. On April twenty-fourth, the firm said that its chief executive Eric Olson will go. A casualty of a growing scandal over its activities in the country, the board of the world's biggest cement producer stated only last month that Mr. Olson was not responsible for nor aware of wrongdoing by the firm in Syria. But public pressure has been increasing, notably after Jean-Luc Mélenchon, a left-wing candidate in France's presidential election, attacked the firm and its damned cement. In a television debate on April fourth, François Fillon, a pro-business rival, agreed the firm should be punished if allegations against it prove to be true. At issue is the activity of Lafarge before the firm's merger with its Swiss rival Holcim in 2015. In 2010, Lafarge had built a cement factory of 240 workers for 680 million dollars. Near Kobani, a North Syrian town, operations there continued until 2014, long after the violence began in 2011. The firm evacuated foreigners in 2012. Local workers fled in September 2014 as Islamic State or IS fighters seized the plant. It looks extraordinary that managers hung on for so long after other foreign firms fled Syria. Most did so soon after violence flared. Lafarge is accused of paying via third parties local armed groups, including some designated as terrorists, to keep the plant open and its staff secure. A report last year in Le Monde, a French paper, said the firm might unwittingly have funded IS. Lafarge Holcim said then that it. Completely rejects the concept of financing of designated terrorist groups, but in March this year, after an internal independent inquiry into possible dealings with armed groups, its board said the investigation had found that measures taken by staff had been unacceptable and described significant errors of judgment, which contravened the firm's code of conduct. Senior managers, not only local staff. New violations of Lafarge's established standards were likely.
In March, the firm said that Bruno Lafont, CEO of Lafarge before the merger and now co-chairman of the merged firm, will not seek re-election. Evidence of exactly what happened in Syria is piling up. A Norwegian security officer at the plant for two years to 2013 has given details in a book of how he visited local militants to exchange information, creating alliances to cope with a power vacuum. France's economy ministry filed a complaint with prosecutors in September 2016, and legal proceedings are ongoing. Lafarge Holcim's troubles do not end there. The company has also attracted criticism from Emmanuel Macron, one of the two candidates in the second round of the election, and from other French politicians for saying it was ready to supply cement for Donald Trump's planned wall along America's border with Mexico. The giant firm's market value is stuck at 15 percent below its level in July 2015 when it began trading, as it struggles to cut costs and generate earnings. The company doubtless hopes that Mr. Olson's resignation will help to put at least one of its headaches behind it. Business, French business, a spring in their step. Business relishes the prospect of Emmanuel Macron as president. The likely election of Emmanuel Macron as France's president in a runoff vote on May 7th has corporate leaders in a state of high anticipation. French politicians with business experience rarely prosper. It is nearly half a century since Georges Pompidou won office in 1969 on the back of a private sector career, partly at Rothschild and investment bank. The sitting president François Hollande roused voters in 2012 by declaring that his true enemy was the world of finance. Mr. Macron's own stint at Rothschild, advising on mergers from 2008 to 2012, included handling a $12 billion acquisition of a unit of Pfizer, a pharma firm, by Nestlé, a consumer goods giant. Markets rose and bond yields fell after Mr. Macron won the first round on April 23. His second-round opponent, Marine Le Pen of the far right, dismays business. One investor admits re-registering his firm as European rather than French. The better to shift headquarters were she to win, but Mr. Macron is favourite. A chief of a big firm headquartered in Paris speaks of new optimism for France's economy if Mr. Macron wins. Business indicators are improving. Measures of corporate confidence, in particular, have been ticking up for a while. A survey by IHS Market on April 21st showed the tenth consecutive monthly increase in private firms' activity. French purchasing managers clock in as markedly more bullish than German ones. The economy has been showing modest vim. GDP figures for the first quarter out on April 28th are expected to register year-on-year -year growth of 1.3 percent, up from 1.1 percent in the previous quarter. Mr. Macron would cut corporation tax and public spending, though less than one rival, François Fillon, promised, and simplify a messy, expensive pensions system. Just as important for business, he promises to build on his previous efforts during a stint as economy minister to ease rigid labour markets that keep unemployment high. Caps on severance pay to fired employees and limits to legal processes that can reverse layoffs are a priority for firms. Though Mr. Macron has said he would not touch France's 35-hour working week, brought in by the socialists in 2000 to 2002, he wants a German-style approach to labour relations, letting individual companies negotiate directly with unions rather than accept national bargains. That would lessen the influence of national, often militant unions on more moderate local ones. Beyond that, his plans to cap France's high tax burden, the state spends 57% of GDP, more than any other big, rich country, also cheers business people and investors. Changes could be designed to send capital to smaller firms, such as the tech startups Mr. Macron has championed in the past.
Though he would not scrap France's wealth tax, he would exclude financial assets from it. By also capping taxes on capital gains, he would make it more attractive to invest in local firms, reckons Ross McInnes, chairman of Safran, a big aeronautical and defence firm. Family-owned and start-up businesses can really benefit. A worry for business as well as for Mr Macron's supporters is that as a political outsider, he may find it hard to get things done in office. His movement en marche, on the move, may not secure a majority at the parliamentary elections to be held in June. Yet he is a vastly happier prospect than Ms Le Pen. Her populist wish list includes talk of getting France out of the euro and imposing import taxes to discourage trade. The greatest service that Mr Macron can provide to corporate France, in other words, would be keeping her out. Business Patan Jali Bend it like Baba How an Indian yogi came to lead a billion-dollar consumer goods juggernaut Executives at firms selling consumer staples like to think of themselves as marketing gurus. But how many could actually contort themselves into the lotus position, let alone attempt a headstand? Such feats are nothing for the top brass at Patanjali, an Indian purveyor of toothpaste, cooking oil, herbal concoctions and much else. Fronted by a bona fide guru, the firm's marketing strategy, play up the benefits of natural products, then paint foreign multinationals as latter-day imperialists, delivers over $1 billion in annual sales, up tenfold in four years. Having dismissed the firm as a fad, the likes of Colgate, Palmolive and Unilever are emulating it. Baba Ramdev, an ascetic yogi who is the public face of the brand, makes for an unconventional capitalist symbol. But with Acharya Balkrishna, a devotee of his who serves as the firm's boss and majority owner, he has built a consumer goods powerhouse that is vying with the business school graduates at the multinationals. Starting out two decades ago as an apothecary of traditional Ayurvedic potions, Patanjali has expanded into personal care, home products, packaged food and more. Mr Ramdev's beard and saffron robes are among India's most widely seen corporate emblems. Marketing textbooks suggest the firm should have stumbled a while back, whereas multinationals such as Procter & Gamble spent heavily to advertise dozens of sub-brands Patanjali grew by word of mouth and sells everything from detergent to cornflakes and hair oil under its own name. Established players outsource their manufacturing and sell through shops owned by third parties. Patanjali has its own plants and has built a network of thousands of exclusive franchise stores across India. Its head office in Haridwar in the foothills of the Himalayas is not in a place consultants would recommend nor would they have predicted the success of its formula, good quality and value plus indignant nationalism. Newspaper ads beseech customers to shake off the yoke of multinational firms in the way their forebears resisted Britain's East India Company. A dash of cow urine in a handful of products, including soap and floor cleaner, burnishes its Hindu credentials. Patanjali's rise coincides with the arrival in office of Narendra Modi, India's yoga-loving Prime Minister in 2014. Mr Ramdev appeared at his political rallies. Its rhetoric is the business counterpart to the Modi government's Hindu-first chauvinism. Opposition politicians have complained that Patanjali has enjoyed low prices for land in deals with state governments that are run by politicians allied to Mr Modi. The company is able to offer customers good value, partly because it spends only 2-3% to of revenues on advertising. Consumer firms typically spend 12-18%. to For many of its products, its modern plants use much the same machinery and inputs as its rivals, but cheaper staff. Lower costs mean operating margins of over 20% in its last published accounts. The firm is unlisted and says it plans to stay that way beating global firms.
Multinational and local rivals at first behaved as if Patanjali did not exist, but after its herbal toothpaste won a dedicated following, in 2015 Colgate launched an offering aimed at Patanjali, the first time in its nearly eight decades in India that it had marketed an explicitly local product. Unilever has a range of Ayurvedic shampoos. Nestle added 25 products across food categories to ward off the beaming guru. But Patanjali is still coming close to matching its sales. Patanjali's latest push is into food staples such as cooking oil and flour. There, it will take market share from unbranded, small-scale rivals rather than multinationals, which steer clear of such low-margin business. More products look likely to get the bearded yogi's seal of approval. A line of purposefully frumpy jeans for women is in the works. Restaurants, maybe too. Skeptics think the company is as big as it can get without becoming more like the multinationals it decries. It is starting to use some of their methods. Patanjali is distributing more of its products outside its own shop network. It is reportedly outsourcing more of its manufacturing too. It is increasing its spending on advertising. Mr. Balkrishna has considered expanding abroad. The firm may also face fiercer domestic competition in future. Other spiritual leaders have noted Patanjali's success. Sri Sri Ravi Shankar, a guru with a big following among the urban middle classes who rivals Mr. Ramdev for Mr. Modi's affections, is branching out from Ayurveda into food and personal care. Gamit Ram Rahim Singh, a self-proclaimed saint who packs out huge stadiums, singing his techno hit "Love Charger," is now in business too, selling more than 400 products. Others will follow. It does not take a marketing guru to figure out how easily followers can be turned into shoppers. Business. Shumpeter. Government Inc. Microsoft's former boss wants Americans to think about their five trillion dollar state like a company. When he was running Microsoft, Steve Ballmer was famous for his energy. In a legendary clip of a company meeting that has received almost a million hits on YouTube, he charges onto the stage and launches into his monkey dance before roaring into a microphone, "I love this company." Mr. Ballmer stood down from the software giant in 2014 and has new outlets for his drive. One is the L.A. Clippers, a basketball team he bought for two billion dollars. The other could not be more different: a project to create a Form 10K, a type of corporate report for America's dysfunctional government. That is more revolutionary than it sounds. In most walks of life, 10K denotes a long-distance run or a sum of money. In the investment world, it refers to the report that American regulators force all listed companies to publish once a year. Investors have a near religious reverence for 10Ks. They are the global gold standard of corporate disclosure. 300 or so warts and all pages that contain a firm's financial accounts and describe its objectives, conflicts of interests, governance, risks, and flaws. Fund managers scour the documents to ensure that firms' executives are not fibbing. Bosses study their competitors' forms. Mr. Balmer's aim is for his 10K on the government to contain everything citizens need to know, without hyperbole and without omission, as he puts it. This may appear an eccentric ambition, but in an era of fake news and partisan division. Many Americans have shown themselves to be hungry for objective information. Mr. Balmer published the nation's first 10K on a new website, USAFacts.org, that was launched on April 18th. It is already wildly popular, receiving 2.6 million page views on its first day. Treating the government like a company has obvious limitations. Firms exist to maximize profits within the law. The job of governments is to maximize the overall welfare of citizens within financial constraints. Governments can tax and print money, so they can borrow far more. Companies' governance is child's play compared with running a nation. 
the government faces many more risks than firms do. Pages 51 to 54 of the new National 10K list as dangers riots, war with a powerful adversary, and also the fact that human behaviour cannot be fully regulated or controlled. Yet there are benefits to looking at Leviathan as you would a firm. A 10K requires that all activities are consolidated together in one place, whereas the government issues millions of documents, GDP accounts, budget documents, crime reports, that rarely cohere and are often gibberish to voters. Mr. Balmer's 10K aggregates every branch of the state, from Alaska's local governments to the Federal Reserve. It splits the total into four operating divisions, based on the Constitution. Each division has its own finances and key performance indicators, as at a company. The numbers show that, as you might expect, the government is hugely complex, with about 100,000 bodies. Its $5 trillion of revenues are 11 times greater than Walmart's, the world's biggest firm by sales. The state's main costs are transfer payments such as welfare and wages for government employees. Viewed as a firm, it has a profit margin of minus 3%, compared with 8% for the aggregate of firms in the S&P 500 index. Even leaving aside education, it invests more in the future than firms. R&D and capital expenditures together take up 12% of revenue, compared with 8% for the S&P 500. But its debts are a whopping 289% of sales, tax revenues, versus 77% for the S&P 500. An investor considering Leviathan Inc. would certainly look askance at its record. Performance over the past decade has been a mixture of stagnation, progression towards and retreat from achievement of our constitutional objectives, says the 10K. And its prospects are dim. As social security and health care costs rise, the deficit and debt levels will deteriorate, even threatening the government's status as a going concern by around 2046. Governance is poor. The country is not managed using a coherent taxonomy. So, for example, the House of Representatives, the Senate and the White House each split the job of running America into roughly 20 operating divisions. But their categories are different, meaning crossed wires and insufficient accountability. Investors detest firms with related party transactions, in which executives receive money from customers, the firm or counterparties on top of their compensation package. Page 152 of Leviathan Inc.'s 10K reveals a troublingly high level of such related party transactions in the form of political funding, much from cash-rich companies as well as from individual donors. The idea that charismatic business people can save the government from itself is a recurring theme in American politics. In 1909, Franklin McVeigh, the Treasury Secretary, promised to run the government on a business basis. Ross Perot, a businessman, ran for president twice using the same logic. Donald Trump is the latest adherent to this view. He has filled his cabinet with swaggering tycoons, such as Wilbur Ross, the Commerce Secretary, hoping they can knock heads together harder than career politicians can. Economists and policy wonks tend to dismiss the idea that government can learn much from business. That seems odd. Certainly, boardroom bravado is not the answer to America's problems, but Mr. Balmer draws on a business tradition different from that of Mr. Trump, its habit of clever, rational analysis. A curious fact about America is that while its government has gradually slid into gridlock and ill repute, its companies have become more globally dominant than at any point, probably in history. Of the world's 20 most valuable firms, 14 are American, including still Microsoft. They are ruthlessly effective about meeting their objectives of greater market power and profits. If you want to find a reliance on facts 
cold rationality and coherent, purposeful organization in America look to its firms rather than to its media or its politicians. The 10K will appear every year. It should be read widely. Briefing The Economist, April 29th to May 5th, 2017. In the briefing section, Central Banks, Battle of Three Centuries. Briefing The History of Central Banks, Battle of Three Centuries. Today's criticisms of central banks echo debates from times past. Twenty years ago next month, the British government gave the Bank of England the freedom to set interest rates. That decision was part of a trend that made central bankers the most powerful financial actors on the planet, not only setting rates, but also buying trillions of dollars worth of assets, targeting exchange rates, and managing the economic cycle. Although central banks have great independence now, the tide could turn again. Central bankers across the world have been criticised for overstepping their brief, having opined about broader issues. The Reserve Bank of India's Raghuram Rajan on religious tolerance, the Bank of England's Mark Carney on climate change. In some countries, the fundamentals of monetary policy are under attack. Recep Tayyip Erdogan, the president of Turkey, has berated his central bank because of his belief that higher interest rates cause inflation. And central banks have been widely slated for propping up the financial sector and denting savers' incomes in the wake of the financial crisis of 2007-08. Such debate is almost as old as central banking itself. Over more than 300 years, the power of central banks has ebbed and flowed as governments have by turns enhanced and restricted their responsibilities in response to economic necessity and intellectual fashion. Governments have asked central banks to pursue several goals at once, stabilising currencies, fighting inflation, safeguarding the financial system, coordinating policy with other countries and reviving economies. These goals are complex and not always complementary. It makes sense to put experts in charge. That said, the actions needed to attain them have political consequences, dragging central banks into the democratic debate. In the early decades after American independence, two central banks were founded and folded before the Federal Reserve was established in 1913. Central banks part in the depression of the 1930s, the inflationary era of the 1960s and 1970s, and the credit bubble in the early 2000s all came under attack. The first central banks were created to enhance the financial power of governments. The pioneer was the Sverius Riksbank, set up as a tool of Swedish financial management in 1668, the celebration of its tercentenary included the creation of the Nobel Prize in Economics. But the template was set by the Bank of England, established in 1694 by William III, ruler of both Britain and the Netherlands, in the midst of a war against France. In return for a loan to the Crown, the bank gained the right to issue banknotes. Monarchs had always been prone to default and had the power to prevent creditors from enforcing their rights, but William depended on the support of Parliament, which reflected the interests of those who financed the central bank. The creation of the bank reassured creditors and made it easier and cheaper for the government to borrow. No one at the time expected these central banks to evolve into the all-powerful institutions of today, but a hint of what was to come lay in the infamous schemes of John Law in France from 1716 to 1720. He persuaded the regent, the king, Louis XV, was an infant, to allow him to establish a national bank and to decree that all taxes and revenues be paid in its notes. The idea was to relieve the pressure on the indebted monarchy. The bank then assumed the national debt. Investors were persuaded to swap the bonds for shares in the Mississippi Company, which would exploit France's American possessions. One of the earliest speculative manias ensued. The word 
millionaire was coined as the Mississippi shares soared in price. But there were no profits to be had from the colonies, and when Law's schemes collapsed, French citizens developed an enduring suspicion of high finance and paper money. Despite this failure, Law was onto something. Paper money was a more useful medium of exchange than gold or silver, particularly for large amounts. Private banks might issue notes, but they were less trustworthy than those printed by a national bank, backed by a government with tax-raising powers. Because paper money was a handier medium of exchange, people had more chance to trade, and as economic activity grew, government finances improved. Governments also noticed that issuing money for more than its intrinsic value was a nice little earner. Alexander Hamilton, America's first Treasury Secretary, admired Britain's financial system. Finances were chaotic in the aftermath of independence. America's first currency, the Continental, was afflicted by hyperinflation. Hamilton believed that a reformed financial structure, including a central bank, would create a stable currency and a lower cost of debt, making it easier for the economy to flourish. His opponents argued that the bank would be too powerful and would act on behalf of northern creditors. In Hamilton, a hit hip-hop musical, the Thomas Jefferson character declares, "But Hamilton forgets his plan would have the government assume states' debts." Now place your bets as to who that benefits. The very seat of government, where Hamilton sits, central banking was one of the great controversies of the New Republic's first half century. Hamilton's bank lasted twenty years until its charter was allowed to lapse in 1811. A second bank was set up in 1816, but it too was resented by many. Andrew Jackson, a populist president, vetoed the renewal of its charter in 1836. A suspicion that central banks were likely to favour creditors over debtors was not foolish. Britain had moved onto the gold standard by accident after the Royal Mint set the value of gold relative to silver higher than it was abroad at around the turn of the 18th century, and silver flowed overseas. Since Bank of England notes could be exchanged on demand for gold, the bank was in effect committed to maintaining the value of its notes relative to the metal. By extension, this meant the bank was committed to the stability of sterling as a currency. In turn, the real value of creditors' assets, bonds and loans, was maintained. On the other side, borrowers had no prospect of seeing debts inflated away. Gold convertibility was suspended during the Napoleonic Wars. Government debt and inflation soared. Parliament restored it in 1819, although only by forcing a period of deflation and recession. For the rest of the century, the bank maintained the gold standard, with the result that prices barely budged over the long term. But the corollary was that the bank had to raise interest rates to attract foreign capital whenever its gold reserves started to fall. In effect, this loaded the burden of economic adjustment onto workers through lower wages or higher unemployment. The order of priorities was hardly a surprise when voting was limited to men of property. It was a fine time to be a rentier. The nineteenth century saw the emergence of another responsibility for central banks: managing crises. Capitalism has always been plagued by financial panics, in which lenders lose confidence in the creditworthiness of private banks. Trade suffered at these moments as merchants lacked the ability to fund their purchases. In the Panic of 1825, the British economy was described as being within 24 hours of a state of barter. After this crisis, the convention was established that the Bank of England act as lender of last resort. Walter Bagehot, an editor of the Economist, defined this doctrine in his book Lombard Street, published in 1873. The central bank should lend freely to solvent banks, which could provide collateral at high rates. The idea was not universally accepted. A former governor of the Bank of England called it the most mischievous doctrine ever breathed in the monetary or banking world. It also involved a potential conflict with the central bank's other roles. Lending in a crisis meant expanding the money supply, but what if that coincided with a need to restrict the money supply in order to safeguard the currency? 
as other countries industrialized in the 19th century, they copied aspects of the British model, including a central bank and the gold standard. That was the pattern in Germany after its unification in 1871. America was eventually tipped into accepting another central bank by the financial panic of 1907, which was resolved only by the financial acumen of John Pierpont Morgan, the country's leading banker. It seemed rational to create a lender of last resort that did not depend on one man. Getting a central bank through Congress meant assuaging the old fears of the eastern money power. Hence, the Fed's unwieldy structure of regional, privately owned banks and a central, politically appointed board. Ironically, no sooner had the Fed been created than the global financial structure was shattered by the First World War. Before 1914, central banks had cooperated to keep exchange rates stable. But war placed domestic needs well ahead of any international commitments. No central bank was willing to see gold leave the country and end up in enemy vaults. The Bank of England suspended the right of individuals to convert their notes into bullion. It has never been fully reinstated. In most countries, the war was largely financed by borrowing. Central banks resumed their original role as financing arms of governments and drummed up investor demand for war debt. Monetary expansion and rapid inflation followed. Reconstructing an international financial system after the war was complicated by the reparations imposed on Germany and by the debts owed to America by the Allies. It was hard to coordinate policy amid squabbling over repayment schedules. When France and Belgium occupied the Ruhr in 1923, after Germany failed to make payments, the German central bank, the Reichsbank, increased its money printing, unleashing hyperinflation. Germans have been wary of inflation and central bank activism ever since. The mark eventually stabilised and central banks tried to put a version of the gold standard back together, but two things hampered them. First, gold reserves were unevenly distributed, with America and France owning the lion's share. Britain and Germany, which were less well endowed, were very vulnerable. Second, European countries had become mass democracies which made the austere policies needed to stabilise a currency in a crisis harder to push through. The political costs were too great. In Britain, the Labour government fell in 1931 when it refused to enact benefit cuts demanded by the Bank of England. Its successor left the gold standard. In Germany, Heinrich Brunning, Chancellor from 1930 to 1932, slashed spending to deal with the country's foreign debts, but the resulting slump only paved the way for Adolf Hitler. America was by then the most powerful economy, and the Fed the centrepiece of the interwar financial system. The central bank struggled to balance domestic and international duties. A rate cut in 1927 was designed to make life easier for the Bank of England, which was struggling to hold on to the gold peg it had readopted in 1925. But the cut was criticised for fueling speculation on Wall Street. The Fed started tightening again in 1928 as the stock market kept booming. It may have overdone it. If central banks struggled to cope in the 1920s, they did even worse in the 1930s. Fixated on exchange rates and inflation, they allowed the money supply to contract sharply. Between 1929 and 1933, 11,000 of America's 25,000 banks disappeared, taking with them customers' deposits and a source of lending for farms and firms. The Fed also tightened policy prematurely in 1937, creating another recession. During the Second World War, central banks resumed their role from the first, keeping interest rates low and ensuring that governments could borrow to finance military spending. After the war, it became clear that politicians had no desire to see monetary policy tighten again. The result in America was a running battle between presidents and Fed chairmen. Harry Truman pressed William McChesney Martin, who ran the Fed from 1951 to 1970, to keep rates low despite the inflationary consequences of the Korean War. Martin refused. After Truman left office in 1953, he passed Martin in the street and uttered just one word. Traitor. Lyndon Johnson was more forceful. He summoned Martin to his Texas ranch and bellowed, 
boys are dying in Vietnam and Bill Martin doesn't care. Typically, Richard Nixon took the bullying furthest, leaking a false story that Arthur Burns, Martin's successor, was demanding a 50% pay rise. Attacked by the press, Burns retreated from his desire to raise interest rates. In many other countries, finance ministries played the dominant role in deciding on interest rates, leaving central banks responsible for financial stability and maintaining exchange rates, which were fixed under the Bretton Woods regime. But like the gold standard, the system depended on governments' willingness to subordinate domestic priorities to the exchange rate. By 1971, Nixon was unwilling to bear this cost, and the Bretton Woods system collapsed. Currencies floated, inflation took off, and worse still, many countries suffered high unemployment at the same time. This crisis gave central banks the chance to develop the powers they hold today. Politicians had shown they could not be trusted with monetary discipline. They worried that tightening policy to head off inflation would alienate voters. Milton Friedman, a Chicago economist and Nobel laureate, led an intellectual shift in favour of free markets and controlling the growth of the money supply to keep inflation low. This monetarist approach was pursued by Paul Volcker, appointed to head the Fed in 1979. He raised interest rates so steeply that he prompted a recession and doomed Jimmy Carter's presidential re-election bid in 1980. Farmers protested outside the Fed in Washington, D.C., Car dealers sent coffins containing the keys of unsold cars. But by the mid-1980s, the inflationary spiral seemed to have been broken. In the wake of Mr. Volcker's success, other countries moved towards making central banks more independent, starting with New Zealand in 1989. Britain and Japan followed suit. The European Central Bank, or ECB, was independent from its birth in the 1990s, following the example of Germany's Bundesbank. Many central bankers were asked to target inflation and left to get on with the job. For a long while, this approach seemed to work perfectly. The period of low inflation and stable economies in the 1990s and early 2000s were known as the Great Moderation. Alan Greenspan... Mr. Volcker's successor was dubbed the maestro. Rather than bully him, presidents sought his approbation for their policies. Nevertheless, the seeds were being sown for today's attacks on central banks. In the early 1980s, financial markets began a long bull run as inflation fell. When markets wobbled, as they did on Black Monday in October 1987, the Fed was quick to slash rates. It was trying to avoid the mistakes of the 1930s when it had been too slow to respond to financial distress. But over time, the markets seemed to rely on the Fed stepping in to rescue them, a bet nicknamed the Greenspan put, after an option strategy that protects investors from losses. Critics said that central bankers were encouraging speculation. However, there was no sign that the rapid rise in asset prices was having an effect on consumer inflation. Raising interest rates to deter stock market speculation might inflict damage on the wider economy, and although central banks were supposed to ensure overall financial stability, supervision of individual banks was not always in their hands. The Fed shared responsibility with an alphabet soup of other agencies, for example. When the credit bubble finally burst in 2007 and 2008, central banks were forced to take extraordinary measures – pushing rates down to zero, or even below, and creating money to buy bonds and crush long-term yields, quantitative easing, or QE. As governments tightened fiscal policy from 2010 onwards, it sometimes seemed that central banks were left to revive the global economy alone. Their response to the crisis has called forth old criticisms. In an echo of Jefferson and Jackson, QE has been attacked for bailing out the banks rather than the heartland economy, for favouring Wall Street rather than Main Street. Some Republicans want the Fed to make policy by following set rules. They deem QE a form of printing money. The ECB has been criticised both for favouring northern European creditors over southern European debtors and for cosseting southern spendthrifts.
and central banks are still left struggling to cope with their many responsibilities. As watchdogs of financial stability, they want banks to have more capital. As guardians of the economy, many would like to see more lending. The two roles are not always easily reconciled. Perhaps the most cutting criticism they face is that, despite their technocratic expertise, central banks have been repeatedly surprised. They failed to anticipate the collapse of 2007-8 or the eurozone's debt crisis. The Bank of England's forecasts of the economic impact of Brexit have so far been wrong. It is hard to justify handing power to unelected technocrats if they fall down on the job. All of which leaves the future of central banks uncertain. The independence granted them by politicians is not guaranteed. Politicians rely on them in a crisis. When economies recover, they chafe at the constraints central banks impose. If history teaches anything, it is that central banks cannot take their powers for granted. Finance and economics. The Economist, April twenty ninth to May fifth, two thousand and seventeen, in the finance and economics section. Trade policy confusion reigns. Buttonwood on exchange traded funds. Free exchange on war and growth, and more. Finance and economics. Trade policy, all at sea. Donald Trump may yet turn out as protectionist in office as on the campaign trail. Well, I'm mostly there on most items," said Donald Trump of his 100-day plan. As far as trade policy is concerned, his self-assessment would indeed be true. If tweets and executive orders ratcheting up tensions in a growing number of trade disputes constituted progress. However, although Mr. Trump has withdrawn America from the Trans-Pacific Partnership or TPP, a 12-country trade deal, he has neither labelled China a currency manipulator nor made progress in renegotiating the North American Free Trade Agreement or NAFTA. On April 26th, his administration denied reports that it was poised to trigger America's withdrawal from the agreement. No new America First trade deals have emerged, and his trade-related executive orders have requested reports or investigations. Mr. Trump has created more work for pencil pushers than for exporters. The slow pace might reflect the obvious ideological infighting within his team, a desire for evidence before acting, or the realization that Congress, which sees trade policy as within its remit, must be kept on side. Congress officially delegates responsibility for trade to the United States Trade Representative. But it has yet to confirm Robert Lighthizer, Mr. Trump's pick for the job. Another reason for delay is that other priorities have intervened. Seeking China's help over North Korea's nuclear program, for example, Mr. Trump has explicitly used American trade concessions as an inducement. Mr. Trump has done enough, however, to prod America's trading partners into action. Both the Canadian and Mexican governments have been busily strengthening trade ties elsewhere. Mexican officials say they have stepped up efforts to finish a trade deal with the EU by the end of the year. They also report that Mr. Trump's threats have swayed private sector opinion. Business now understands that Mexican negotiators will have a stronger hand in talks with America if they can credibly threaten to import wheat and corn from Brazil or Argentina. So it now backs the government's courtship of Brazil. The EU has seen its proposed trade deal with America plunged into the deep freeze, so its trade commissioner Cecilia Malmstrom has trumpeted trade talks with Japan and the ASEAN countries of Southeast Asia, as well as with Australia, New Zealand, and Chile. If Mr. Trump does not want to party, goes the implicit threat. Others do. Mr. Trump may even have eased Ms. Malmstrom's job by making anti-trade sentiment less cool and fashionable, particularly in Germany. 
She claimed on March 29th that there has never been a more important time to defend the global rules-based system. With Mr. Trump seemingly hostile to America's traditional role as promoter of that rules-based system, the Japanese are also keen to fill the gap. Shinzo Abe, Japan's prime minister, had called the TPP meaningless without America, but his government is now trying to salvage it. Too much time, effort, and political capital have been invested in TPP to give it up without a fight. And the advanced trade rules TPP imposed are too valuable to waste. Japanese officials are busy garnering support to revive the deal. In time, its economic and strategic benefits might even lure America back. A distant dream, though some joke that renaming the deal the Trump-Pacific Partnership might do the trick. The travails of the TPP have been expected to invigorate the other big trade deal in Asia and the Pacific, the Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership, or RCEP. That does not involve America and is seen as a chance for the Chinese government to show regional leadership. Although the pace of talks picked up after Mr. Trump's election, progress remains glacial. Marie Pangestu, a former Indonesian trade minister, says that some of the seven TPP members, who are also in RCEP, would like to see some elements moved across. But at this point in the negotiations, it's probably best to focus on what is already on the table. Even were he interested in new multilateral trade deals, Mr. Trump would find his authority constrained. On NAFTA, a drastic action such as triggering withdrawal would be his prerogative. But in any renegotiation, he will be partly beholden to Congress. On trade disputes, however, more is at stake, and there is more cause for alarm at the damage Mr. Trump's trigger-happy approach might wreak. Since 1995, the World Trade Organization, or WTO, has been the main arbiter of international trade disputes. But on April 19th, Mr. Trump's administration seemed to take matters into its own hands, starting an investigation into whether steel imports are a threat to national security. A similar probe into aluminium imports was announced this week. America has also imposed duties averaging 20% on imports of Canadian lumber. Wilbur Ross, the Commerce Secretary, will oversee the investigations. He cites the improbable worry that cheap metal imports are undermining America's skills base and its ability to mount a rapid military build-up if needed. Current steel policy, a slew of 152 narrow tariffs on various products, are too easy to circumvent. He is considering broader measures. His department has 270 days to assess the problem and recommend action. Mr. Trump said he expected results within 30 to 50 days. Fans of the rules-based system are aghast. Chad Brown, a trade expert at the Peterson Institute for International Economics, a think tank, describes the Trade Expansion Act, the law from 1962 the Trump administration has invoked, as the nuclear option, adding that it calls the whole rules-based system into question. The Act, sparse on details, gives the President huge discretion. WTO rules bar countries from slapping tariffs on randomly, but make an exception for national security. James Backus, a former chief judge for the WTO and a former congressman, comments that no one knows what it means and no one wants to know what it means. He says it could be a Pandora's box used to justify any type of trade restriction. Mr. Backus worries that if America looks for excuses to violate trade rules, other countries will too. WTO law only succeeds if those who are bound by it engage in mutual self-restraint. We Americans should be the first to show self-restraint. Mr. Trump has relinquished America's role of stewardship of the global rules-based system. The question is whether the system will survive such a loss.
finance and economics. Steel tariffs, striking when the iron is cold. The case against protecting American steelmakers from imports. As an example of all that is wrong with Donald Trump's view of trade, the probe he has ordered into the steel industry is particularly hard to beat. If it results, as seems to be the plan, in blanket punitive tariffs slapped on steel imports, the consequences would be dire. The American economy would be hurt by a rise in the price of an essential material. It would invite retaliation that would cost American jobs, not save them. And the underlying problem, massive global steel overcapacity, would persist. For Trumpists, steel is an emblem of their country's descent from greatness. Ever since the 1960s, when production peaked at 168 million tons a year, the industry has been in decline. Today, it makes half as much as 50 years ago and employs just a third of the workers. Steelmakers have long blamed foreign rivals for their woes and lobbied hard for protection. So, Mr. Trump is not the first president to try to shield the industry from foreign competition. In the 1980s, Ronald Reagan signed a series of agreements to limit imports. In 2002, George W. Bush imposed tariffs of up to 30 percent. Back then, the bogeymen were steelmakers in Europe and Japan. Now it is China, where a glut of steel has squashed prices. Cheap steel, however, is a boon to many producers as well as to consumers. Higher prices would hit firms that use the metal, such as car makers. Mr. Bush's tariffs, for instance, are estimated to have cost 200,000 jobs in these industries, more than the 145,000 Americans employed in steelmaking today. Moreover, the big threat to steelmakers' jobs comes not from trade but technology. In the Reagan era, 80% of the metal was made in the traditional way, converting iron ore and coke into pig iron in a blast furnace before turning this into steel. Only a third is made in this way today. Scrap metal is replacing new pig iron. Smaller electric arc furnaces are more efficient, thanks in large part to cheaper electricity, and can compete on quality and cost with blast furnaces. Methods that use shale gas instead of coal to make iron for steel making are also replacing pig iron. Thanks to such advances, labour productivity in steel making has increased fivefold since the 1980s, according to the American Iron and Steel Institute, a trade association. Tariffs will not bring lost jobs back, nor would they solve the underlying problem in global steel markets, which is the huge excess steel capacity in China. Indeed, they could be counterproductive in their effects. Existing trade production measures have successfully diverted Chinese steel to other markets. In 2016, Chinese steel made up just 4% of American steel imports, compared with 27% from Mexico and Canada combined, and 23% from the European Union. A tariff that was imposed on imports from other countries would risk splitting a potential alliance between America and the rest of the world against China. If a blanket tariff were to spark a wider trade war, the irony is that the biggest losers would include modern American steelmakers. At last, they are becoming competitive abroad again. If Mr. Trump really wants to boost American steel, free trade would be a much better bet. Finance and economics. Credit Suisse. Tiam's tweak. Another change of plan at Switzerland's second biggest bank. Europe's most troubled big banks may at last be on the road to recovery. Not only is economic growth perking up, uncomfortable decisions put off too long are also being taken. In recent months, Unicredit, Italy's largest lender. Has written down bad debt by 8.1 billion euro. That's 8.7 billion dollars, and tapped shareholders for 13 billion euro. Deutsche Bank, Germany's biggest, has raised 8 billion euro in equity and decided to keep a retail business it had hoped to sell. 
On April 27th, it reported first quarter net income of 575 million euro, up from 236 million euro a year earlier, although revenue fell. Like Deutsche, Credit Suisse is freer to make plans after a recent settlement with American authorities over mis-selling mortgage-backed securities before the financial crisis. On April 26th, Switzerland's second biggest bank reported first quarter net income of 596 million Swiss francs, that's $594 million, far better than forecast, reversing a 302 million Swiss franc loss a year before. Along with most of Wall Street, which published earnings earlier in the month, and Deutsche, it benefited from a good quarter for fixed income trading. It expects to wind up a unit in which it has dumped unwanted assets by the end of 2018, a year ahead of schedule. Credit Suisse's chief executive, Tijan Tiam, has also ditched a plan to float 20 to 30 percent of the group's Swiss Universal Bank, part of a scheme conceived in 2015 to raise 9 billion to 11 billion Swiss francs of capital. He now intends to bring in 4 billion Swiss francs through a rights issue. Share sales in 2015 raised 6 billion Swiss francs. Shareholders had never been keen on the flotation, which would have diluted their returns from the division that contributes most to Credit Suisse's profits. A climb in the share price by more than 50% since July has made a rights issue more attractive. The issue will lift Credit Suisse's ratio of common equity to risk-weighted assets, a key gauge of bank strength, from 11.7% to 13.4%. That boosts it from a middling position among its European peers, but still leaves it behind Deutsche and UBS, its bigger Swiss neighbour. Mr. Tian claimed the quarterly figures endorsed a strategic shift towards Asia, which he announced 18 months ago. He considers the region's newly rich to be ideal clients for a bank which can meet the needs of both their businesses and their families. Credit Suisse's Asian division, like the Swiss Universal Bank, provides wealth management and investment banking locally. Functional divisions serve the rest of the world. To many, this structure looks lopsided. Mr. Tiam is sure that it is working. The Asian wealth management business saw profits rise by two-thirds in the year to the first quarter. The region's markets business tumbled into loss, but Mr. Tiam insists that a change of management will help turn it around. All this should placate shareholders who have had plenty to grumble about and whom Mr. Tiam faces at the annual meeting on April 28th. This month he and other executives gave up 40% of their latest bonuses, which had been criticised by advisers to institutional investors. The bosses had hit their targets, but the bank lost money in 2015 and 2016. Better luck this year. Finance and Economics Buttonwood Jumping the Shark The exchange-traded fund industry is getting too specialised. There comes a time when every financial innovation is taken a bit too far, when, in television terms, it jumps the shark and sacrifices plausibility in search of popularity. That may have happened in the exchange-traded fund or ETF industry. The latest ETF to be launched is a fund that invests in the shares of ETF providers. The notion has a certain logic. The ETF industry has been growing fast thanks to its ability to offer investors a diversified portfolio at low cost. The assets under management in these funds passed $3 trillion last year, up from $715 billion in 2008. Some investors might well want to take advantage of that rapid expansion. But by no stretch of the imagination would this be a well-diversified portfolio. It would be a focused bet on the financial sector, and many of the companies in the portfolio, such as BlackRock, a huge fund manager, and NASDAQ, a stock exchange, are involved in a lot more than just ETFs. 
Even if the ETF industry keeps growing, the bet could still go wrong. The new fund, with the catchy title of the ETF Industry Exposure and Financial Services ETF, is just the latest example of the industry's drive to specialization. The earliest ETFs bought diversified portfolios that track indices such as the S&P 500. But there are now some 1,338 specialist funds worldwide, with $434 billion in assets, according to ETFGI, a research firm. Some of these specialist funds are based on industries such as energy or media. They appeal to investors who believe an industry will outperform, but who do not want to pin their hopes on an individual company. But others are pretty obscure. An ETF that invests in founder-run companies with just $3.1 million in assets, for example, or another which buys shares in companies based near Nashville, Tennessee, with $8.5 million. A recent fund was launched to back companies involved in the cannabis industry. Heady stuff, but the more specialized the fund, the fewer companies it has to invest in. So these funds will probably be more volatile and less liquid, not the ideal home for the savings of small investors. The financial industry has been down this road before. In the early 2000s, Britain suffered a crisis in the investment trust sector. Like ETFs, investment trusts are managed portfolios that are traded on the stock market. They have been around since the 19th century, but a craze developed for so-called split capital trusts, which had different classes of shares. Some received all the income from the fund, others all the capital growth. These shares had some tax advantages and were snapped up by small investors. However, some split capital trusts only invested in the shares of other trusts. When problems emerged in some funds, they rippled right through the asset class, eventually requiring nearly two hundred million pounds—that's two hundred and fifty-eight million dollars—to be paid out in compensation. A similar pattern emerged on a much bigger scale with mortgage-backed securities, or MBS, in America. The idea of issuing a bond backed by mortgage payments dates back to the nineteenth century. But the residential MBS market took off in the 1980s. The market jumped the shark only in the early 2000s with the rapid growth of vehicles known as collateralized debt obligations or CDOs that grouped mortgage-backed bonds together, giving different investors different rights over the assets and cash flows of the portfolio. Doubts over the creditworthiness of these securities in 2007 triggered the financial crisis. The ETF sector has not yet reached the extremes attained by split capital trusts or CDOs. By and large, funds do not invest directly in other ETFs, although there are a few leveraged ETFs where losses and gains are magnified. They represent only one percent of the industry's assets. Still, there are signs that rapid flows into some ETFs can lead to price distortions. A rush of money into gold funds in recent years has caused the Vanek Junior Gold Miners ETF to be the largest investor in two thirds of the 54 companies it owns, according to FactSet, a data provider. The fund's assets grew by more than half to reach 5.4 billion dollars between January 1st and April 17th. The rush was accelerated by another fund, which made a leveraged bet on the performance of the Vanek ETF. The danger is of a feedback effect. As the fund pours money into the smaller companies in its portfolio, their prices rise, attracting more money into the ETF. But should investors change their mind and want to withdraw their money, there could be a sharp fall in these mining shares. Vanek is allowing the fund to invest in larger companies in an attempt to solve the problem. But the more the ETF industry specialises, the more often such difficulties are going to arise. Finance and economics, crowdfunding, coining it. 
Another bubble is heading for a bust, but may spawn much innovation. Would you care to invest in Gnosis, a prediction market where users can bet on outcomes of events such as elections, or in ZR Coin, a project to produce zirconium dioxide used to make heat-resistant alloys? How about an immersive reality experience called Back to Earth? These are just three of a new wave of what are called initial coin offerings or ICOs. Nearly two hundred and fifty million dollars has already been invested in such offerings, of which one hundred and seven million dollars alone has flowed in this year, according to Smith and Crown, a research firm. But it was in April that ICOs or token sales, as insiders prefer to call them, really took off. On April twenty-fourth, Gnosis collected more than twelve million dollars in under fifteen minutes, valuing the project in theory at nearly three hundred million dollars. ICO coins are essentially digital coupons, tokens issued on an indelible distributed ledger or blockchain of the kind that underpins Bitcoin, a cryptocurrency. That means they can easily be traded, although unlike shares, they do not confer ownership rights. Instead, they often serve as the currency for the project they finance to pay users for a correct prediction, as does Gnosis, or for the content users contribute. Investors hope that successful projects will cause tokens' value to rise. In a way, Bitcoin was the first ICO, except that instead of putting money in directly, investors had to buy computing gear to mine, i.e., mint cryptographically the tokens. Bitcoin inspired hundreds of variations, altcoins, but these involved the tricky business of creating a new blockchain. Today, most issuers simply write a smart contract on Ethereum, a rival blockchain. This piece of code then automatically creates tokens when it receives Ether, the coin of the Ethereum realm. Issuers typically publish a white paper, a prospectus of sorts, and market their undertaking on social media. As Gnosis shows, such offerings can sell out quickly. The cryptocurrency Cognoscenti made a lot of money investing in Bitcoin and other tokens, and have cash to invest. As the Economist went to press, the value of all Ether in circulation was nearly five billion dollars. Less popular projects offer incentives for buying early or a lot. Back to Earth, whose ICO launched on April 26th, wants to raise 750 Bitcoin, almost one million dollars, by selling star credits. Investors who buy coins worth 0.75 Bitcoin or more get a special golden ticket, entitling them to special content and later on free star credits. But the claims in white papers are mostly unaudited. ZR Coin plans to build a factory in Russia to extract zirconium from industrial waste. Cameras on the site are supposed to let investors monitor progress. ZR coins are backed by the zirconium to be produced, but as in many ICOs, it is unclear why the funds are not raised in conventional ways. And since most ICOs have no link to any particular jurisdiction, it is hard to see what investors could do if issuers abscond with their money. Often they have immediate access to the funds raised. Even ICO fans fret that an offering will blow up, as did Mt. Gox, an early Bitcoin exchange in 2014. But the market is showing signs of maturing, says Matt Schaferent of Smith and Crown. More ICOs now use escrow accounts, which makes it harder to take the money and run. Blockchain Capital, a venture capital firm, has just raised ten million dollars, but it sold its coins in America only to accredited investors. On May first, Adele, an incubator for blockchain projects, will launch one of the first ICOs to comply with anti-money laundering and know your customer rules. Autonomos, which helps firms incorporate, is planning to offer a service giving ICOs a legal home. Regulators will have to decide how to deal with ICOs. Peter Van Valkenburg of Coin Center, a think tank, argues that if the tokens are mainly used as currencies, they should not be classified as securities. But in March, the Ontario Securities Commission warned that issuers may need to meet legal requirements, such as registration and filing an official prospectus. 
this may be hard to enforce. Blockchains know no borders, and some ICOs, including Gnosis's, are created expressly to avoid regulations. America's Securities and Exchange Commission has not said anything yet. Insiders worry it will come down too hard on ICOs, stymieing innovation. Albert Wenger of Union Square Ventures, another venture capital firm, argues that ICOs help finance projects that today remain unfunded. In particular, protocols, code enabling computer systems to work together. One example is Storage, a service for decentralized file storage, which has issued tokens on Bitcoin's blockchain. Subscribers use the currency to pay for file storage, but can also earn it by contributing storage to the network. They hope such services might one day replace the big centralized ones that dominate the internet. Imagine Facebook had issued a token, says Olaf Carlson Wee of Polychain Capital, a hedge fund that invests in ICOs. Users could be paid for their posts and thereby share in the firm's wealth. Still, before ICOs fulfil this promise, they may well have to endure a cycle of boom and bust. Some liken the ICO craze to the South Sea bubble in the early 18th century in Britain, when promoters raised funds for companies promising the transmutation of quicksilver into a malleable fine metal or a wheel for perpetual motion. Prices soon fell, in particular after Parliament in 1720 passed the Bubble Act to rein in undertakings of great advantage. But the sorry episode was a step toward some rather useful innovations, the modern joint stock company, for example. Correction: In our article "Private Matters" last week on financing infrastructure, we referred to the Ottawa Teachers Pension Fund. We meant the Ontario Teachers Pension Fund. Sorry. <laughs> Finance and economics. Free exchange. Minor threat. In times of peace, governments grow complacent. Ponder the dire state of infrastructure in America and some other advanced economies, and their government's facklessness boggles the mind. Time was when they were able to make badly needed investments. The roads and the universities were a priority. What changed? Not for nothing do pundits cite the hustling governments of China and Singapore as evidence that liberal democracies are no longer fit for purpose. But democracy is not the problem; rather, governments may lack motivation in what is, despite appearances, an unusually peaceful world. War is hell. The less of it, the better. Yet it has also been a near constant feature of human history, and a constant stimulus to political evolution. Defense is a textbook example of a public good. Security benefits all residents of a country and cannot be denied to citizens who prefer not to pay for it. There is little incentive for private forces to provide defence, unless by doing so they can take over the right to extract compensation from the society they protect. Throughout history, the legitimate government is the one that can best defend its people. As populations have grown and technology has advanced, the job of defending societies has become more complex. That, in turn, has spurred the proliferation of government responsibilities. Research by Nicola Genaioli and Hans Joachim Voth suggests that the growing financial demands of warfare after 1500 helped drive the formation of large, strong nation states in Europe. The rising cost of war meant that keeping a state secure required a powerful, centralized government capable of raising large sums of money through tax or via modern central bank-tended financial systems. Their work draws on research by Timothy Besley and Torsten Persson, who reckon state power built to improve defence can yield better economic policy. The capacity to use the tax system to transfer wealth directly, for instance, means society relies less on inefficient sorts of redistribution. Military competition has long given states an interest in technological progress. But the Industrial Revolution and the era of total war led to dramatic changes in the reach of the state. 
America's federal government was slow to get involved in the education of its young people, a matter it left to state and local governments. That changed in 1958. When Dwight Eisenhower signed a law committing roughly $1 billion, more than $8 billion in 2017 dollars, to improving education in science, mathematics, and foreign languages, and to providing new federal loan assistance to university students. The law, the National Defense Education Act, was a response to the launch of Sputnik and fears that America risked losing its technological lead over the Soviet Union, a critical matter of national security in the era of the nuclear-tipped ICBM. America's experience was representative. Mr. Person, in work with Philippe Aguillon and Dorothée Rousset, examined investments in primary education across countries over the past 150 years. They found that substantial investments tend to be made at times of sharpening military rivalries or in response to recent wars, and that democratic governments are especially given to answering strategic threats with investments in schooling. Education was not the only beneficiary. Both DARPA, an American defense research agency responsible for the creation of the early Internet, among other things, and NASA date to Eisenhower-era efforts to foster new technologies with potential strategic applications. So does the law to which America owes its expansive highway network. In the 20th century, it became clear that maintaining a strategic edge required a strong, industrialized economy and a highly skilled workforce. When confronted with vulnerability, governments responded. Despite interminable warfare in Afghanistan and the Middle East, conflicts and battle deaths have dropped since the 1990s, and the end of the Cold War removed the most serious potential source of global conflict. No tears need be shed over that. Beside the toll in human suffering, wars impose huge economic costs. New research by Stephen Broadberry and John Wallace finds that long-run economic advance has less to do with higher growth rates than with reduced frequency and severity of episodes of economic contraction, fighting fewer wars, for example. Yet, in the absence of acute security threats, politics in many countries may have become less effective. Good economic reasons argue for investing in public goods and for building fiscal capacity and a social safety net. But in most societies, preferences for a particular level of infrastructure investment vary far more than views of what constitutes adequate national security. Disagreements can rule out all but the easiest political bargains. Must societies choose between existential military fear and functional government? Not necessarily. Countries could get smaller. In their book, The Size of Nations, Alberto Alessina and Enrico Spalaure note that safety in numbers, i.e. bigger military budgets, comes at a cost. Big countries tend to be more heterogeneous politically, making it harder to satisfy voters. If a country faces fewer security threats, it pays to be smaller, with a more like-minded population. But breaking up countries can itself spark new conflicts. A non-military threat, such as climate change, could provide an incentive to cooperate. But reduced emissions to tackle climate change represent a global public good. Without global coordination, deadbeat countries have an incentive to free ride on the helpful steps taken by other governments. A peaceful world with inadequate infrastructure is preferable to one at constant risk of war but with pothole-free highways. The risk is that political frustration empowers nationalist leaders and inflames geopolitical tensions, and that governments resort to the bad, old-fashioned ways of resolving them. Science and Technology The Economist, April 29th to May 5th, 2017, in the Science and Technology section. The peopling of the Americas, pre-prehistoric man, cybersecurity, stream slip, an artificial womb, the ultimate grow bag, and more.